Well, good morning. Welcome to Price Chapel. It's great to see you today. Thanks for joining us. And for those joining us online, welcome to Price Chapel as well. We're glad that you're joining us from uh, wherever you're at right now. Uh, today is the first Sunday of Lent. Lent is the season leading up to Easter, a season of fasting and prayer and examination, a season where we remember the sufferings of Jesus, a uh, temptation that he went through, and um, we prepare in our own hearts for Easter Sunday uh, during this season. And so today, being this Lenten season, I want to begin with a responsive reading that's a responsive reading of confession together. And so um, I'll read the part that says leader, and then if you'll read the part that says everyone, and we'll engage in this practice together. Would you please stand? Forgive us, Father, for the sins we have committed against you, against others, against your creation, and against ourselves. Restore us, O oh God, and make your face shine on us that we may be saved. Return to us, Almighty God. Watch over your people. Revive us as we call in your name. Restore us, O oh God. Make your face shine on us that we may be saved. You have raised up a people for yourself, that your glory would fill the earth as the waters cover the sea. Restore us, O oh God, and make your face shine upon us as we be saved. Amen. Let's sing of his grace and love and faithfulness together this morning.
Father God, I pray that we would trust that better is one day in your courts, that as we stand in your presence this morning, that God, we could have that experience of being in your presence. God, we know that it is true because your word says that it's true. And so God, may we internalize that truth this morning, knowing that we are here in your presence, our creator, our God and king, and that we can trust you in everything because of your presence. We thank you, we praise you this morning, we give you all the praise that you are to us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I'm going to invite up Pastor Steve. You may be seated. Thank you, Alex and Steve and Renee, for leading us in worship this morning. It's great to see you here today with us. Um, 
If you want to grab a, a bul- our digital bulletin on uh, Instagram or Facebook and check it out, I um, wanted to share our announcements this morning, some of the things we have coming up. We are in the season called Lent, as I said at the beginning of the service, and every Wednesday during this Lent season, I'm going to be sharing a short video devotional on our Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube uh, pages and channels uh, that'll just help you during this season to reflect uh, this short kind of four to five minute video. So be looking for that, and thanks for those of you that engaged with it this last week. Uh, Next Sunday, we're going to be having a volunteer meeting for all of our kids' ministry workers. So if you serve in nursery or Mighty Kids or Powerhouse classes, uh, we're going to have a meeting from 1230 to 2 down in the fellowship hall. and want to invite you uh, to that. We're also putting together our schedules for our different volunteer groups from ushers to greeters to children's ministry to worship team for March through May right now. And one with, uh, a couple of needs that we do have is we could use uh, maybe one more person to serve as an usher and one more adult helper in our Mighty Kids class. So if you're interested in, in either of those, please uh, let me know. I'd love to talk to you about that. Uh, next Monday, March 1st, we're going to be at March already here pretty soon, which is crazy. Um, which I love because that means the weather's going to start getting warmer, right? Maybe not less windy, but warmer, uh, hopefully. Sometimes, I remember the first year we moved here, we moved here seven years ago at the beginning of March, and we had a beautiful March, and so I'm, I'm hoping for that this year, although we do need more snow, so it's a give and take. But on March 1st, we're going to begin a series of seminars on the intersection between faith and technology. It's something I've been kind of studying and wrestling with for a few years, and um, when I did my Doctor of Ministry program, it was a topic we, we, we talked about a lot. In fact, I had a couple of my friends in my program that did their dissertations really on this subject. And so um, h- how do faith and technology intersect? Um, what does it mean to have a Christian worldview and engage with algorithms and robotics and AI and these things that are actually controlling our world uh, beneath the surface? And uh, genetic engineering and nanotechnology and these things that are going to be changing Uh, the world going forward. And so we'll be diving into that the first Monday of every month in March, April, and May from 7 to 8.30 here at the Church of New York. Invited, I hope you can join me in that conversation. On March 21st, we're going to have our next Body Life Sunday where we celebrate baptisms and uh, welcome in new members to our church community. We do child dedications. We share the stories of what God's doing in our family. And if you're interested in getting baptized, you haven't been baptized since becoming a follower of Jesus, please let me know. I'd love to get, have you be baptized that day and meet with you about that. We're also offering a new members class on uh, sorry Sunday, March 7th at 7 p.m. Uh, here at Price Chapel. I'll be teaching that. So if you're interested in um, any of those, please let me know. We also have a sh- sign-up sheet for Body Life Sunday that's out on what will one day be our coffee bar in the lobby. I can't wait for that day, you too, when we can go to church without masks. It's just not the same experience being spaced out and having masks on and stuff, so uh, one day it will be different. And then I uh, just wanted to also just have on your radar that Easter and Good Friday are coming up. Easter is the first Sunday in April, and Good Friday is April 2nd. We're planning on doing a Good Friday service here at the church that evening at 7 o'clock. Um, we're not able this year to do our community Good Friday service, but hopefully we'll be able to resume that tradition next year in 2022. So that's it for announcements. Um, I'm excited to begin a new series in the book of Ruth this morning. Would you pray with me before we do? Gracious Father in heaven, I thank you that you are faithful as we've sung about today, that you are present with us, that better is one day in your courts and your presence than a thousand go astray. I pray that you would give us increased desire and hunger for you today that we'd desire to know you and to make you known. And I pray now as we come to your word that you would open our eyes that we may see, open our ears that we may hear, and soften our hearts that we may receive that which you have to say to us individually and that which you have to say to us corporately as a church community. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Amen. Have you ever been at that point where you were just ready to, to toss in the towel? Like you just wanted to give up. You're just like, enough things have gone bad. Enough things keep breaking or, or you know, just I can't get through this relationship anymore. Or people keep dying around me or just dealing with sickness and, and issues in your body. And you're just ready to like give in the towel. You're just ready to give up. Anyone ever been there? I think most of us can say it. at some point in our lives we've been there. 
Uh, I had a, a couple different conversations this week with people who were at that place. Where just like, I don't think I can handle anymore. I can't handle all this. I'm like, I'm ready to throw in the towel. You know, we had that, that Christian saying, God won't give you more than you can handle. God won't give you more than you can handle. Anyone know what Bible verse that's from? Good, because it's not in the Bible. Actually, that saying is not in the Bible. I'm going to do a series one day on all the little Christian sayings that aren't in the Bible and aren't biblical, because um, I just love to, to burst those things. But that saying is not in the Bible. In fact, often we're given more than we can handle, and that's what makes us turn to God and be like, I, I can't handle what I have, so I, I need you in the midst of this. And it's often people show up at church for the first time, like never gone to church before, and they show up at church because they are experiencing more than they can handle. They're ready to throw in the towel. And they're like, I, I got to find something. I need some sort of help. I need God in my life, maybe, or, or something. Um, and so they walk into the doors of the church for the first time. And so when you see someone come to Prince Chapel for the first time, just know, like, that may be where they're at. This morning, we're starting this story, uh, the book of Ruth. And chapter one of Ruth is, is really about a woman named Naomi who's ready to throw in the towel. She's been given more than she can handle. She's dealing with more loss than, than she can bear, and she's ready to just give up. And during the story, we'll be kind of looking at uh, how does Naomi deal with this and what lessons can we learn if we're in a similar place in life. And, and then the good news is, is when we're in that place, it's not the end of the story. And so I invite you to come with me to the book of Ruth this morning. If you have a Bible or app on your phone, you can come there. We're going to be in chapter 1, Ruth is in the Old Testament, the Hebrew Scriptures. Uh, this is about how far it is uh, into my Bible. It's the eighth book of the Old Testament. And so if you're new to the Scriptures, the first five books of the Old Testament are called the Torah or the Pentateuch. And they are Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And then after those five, we have a book called Joshua and then Judges and then Ruth. It's just a sliver of a book, four chapters, before we get into First and Second Samuel, which is the story of David and the kings of Israel, and Ruth is essentially the backstory to the story that happens in First and Second Samuel, and ultimately, even with Jesus. And so, it's an important story for us to know. And so, we're going to read the scriptures today in three different sections. We'll start in Ruth chapter one, looking at verses one through five. In those days, when the judges ruled, there was famine in the land. And so a man from Bethlehem in Judah, together with his wife and his two sons, went to live for a while in the country of Moab. And the man's name was Elimelech, and his wife's name was Naomi. And the names of their sons were Malon and Kilion. And they were Ephraites from Bethlehem, Judah. And they went to Moab, and they lived there. Now, Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left with her two sons. And they married Moabite women, one named Ophrah and the other Ruth. And after they had lived there about 10 years, both Malon and Kilion also died. And Naomi was left without her two sons and her husband. And so kind of a bummer, the first five verses there, you can see how Naomi's life, everything's kind of fallen apart and she could be ready to just kind of toss in the towel. But the beginning of the story as the scene is set, the, the storyteller says, in the days where the judges ruled. There was a famine in the land. Now, this is this time period in Israel's history. There was the time period of the judges lasted about 400 years, roughly. It's it's the time period uh, after Moses' leadership and Joshua, um, uh, up until when Israel begins to have kings. And in those times, there was a lot of chaos in Israel. Uh, the people of Israel were very disobedient. They they get led astray, worship other gods, get into all kinds of evil things, and then God would raise up a judge. He'd raise up a woman like Deborah or a man like Gideon who would lead God's people back to him and, and to some sort of short-lived peace and prosperity, and then it would start all over again, and the cycle just repeats. And so if you read the book of Judges, it's frustrating. Like, you, you, you literally can get upset as you're reading it. And one of the recurring statements in that book is that in, in those days, everyone did as they saw fit. In those days, everyone did as they saw fit. And so you can imagine a society where, like, you know what, just do whatever feels good to you. Do, do whatever uh, feels right. Do, do whatever you see fit. That, that causes some problems. And so we know, beginning of the story, it's in a time of chaos. And in this season of chaos, there's famine in the land. And the famine's taking place in the city of Bethlehem. 
Now, this is interesting because Bethlehem's an important city in the scriptures. I got to go to uh, Bethlehem a year and a half ago, and it was cool to kind of get to visualize what Bethlehem was like. It's just a few miles from Jerusalem. And Bethlehem, the name Bethlehem means house of, anyone know? House of bread. So it's interesting. There's famine in the house of bread. The house of bread literally has no bread. The cupboards are empty in the house of bread. Bethlehem will ultimately become known as the city of David. It'll be the city where David is from. And Ruth's story is important for setting the stage for David's story. And Bethlehem will also be the city where someone important is born, right? Where Jesus, the Messiah, will be born. The bread of life will be born in the house of bread. And so this is where we're at. This family lived in Bethlehem and seems seems to be going well until this famine hit. Their names were Elimelech, which means my God is king, and Naomi, which means the pleasant one. And names in in Hebrew culture have particularly important understanding and, and meaning. And so we have my God is king and the pleasant one, and they have two boys. So a nice family of four. Things seem to go going well for them, but this famine happens, and they're like, we got to feed our kids, and they had heard there was food in Moab. Now, Moab is on the other side of the Dead Sea. It's a long 70 to 100 mile journey, depending kind of where they end up in Moab, because it's a big area. And it's an, an area where um, the descendants of Lot, Lot was a relative of Abraham, who the, the nation of Israel comes from, his descendants settle in Moab. And these are people that have some similar customs, but some very different customs and different gods. And they journey to Moab. And they think things are going to be all right, but then Naomi loses her husband. And for anyone who's lost a spouse, you know how painful that is. You know how devastating that is. But the good news is she still has two sons. And she, she finds wives in Moab for those sons. And so things are looking up again, like, okay, we're going to be all right. But uh, they spend 10 years there. And in those 10 years, her daughter-in-laws never have any children. And so even in the place they've gone to escape famine, there's famine, there's barrenness in that land. And then... After 10 years of being there, both her sons die. And we don't get any of the story, like, how they die. It's like, what happens? I'm very curious. It's one of those, like, anyone have a list of questions for heaven? A list of questions for Jesus one day? That I'm a, that's going to be on mine. Can you fill in the story for me? How did they die? But they die. And, and so Naomi is left in this very awkward, very vulnerable situation. To be a woman without a husband and without sons and that day was to, to be very vulnerable. You, you couldn't just like go out and get a job. You couldn't just go out and buy property. You, you didn't have a, a constitution and a bill of rights to protect you. And so Naomi is in a, in a rough spot. She has to decide what she's going to do. And she has these daughters-in-law with her, but they're from Moab. And they need to go on with their lives. And so let's uh, pick up the story in verse 6. It says this, When Naomi heard in Moab that the Lord had come to the aid of his people by providing food for them, she and her daughters-in-law prepared to return home from there. With her two daughters-in-law, she left the place where she had been living and set out on the road that would take them back to the land of Judah. And so it's like almost they're beginning this journey back to Bethlehem, and then Naomi's like, wait, am I doing the right thing? Should I be taking these women with me? And it says in verse 8, then Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, go back, each of you, to your mother's home. May the Lord show you kindness as you have shown kindness to your dead husbands and to me. May the Lord grant that each of you will find rest in the home of another husband. And then she kissed them goodbye, and they wept aloud and said to her, We will go back with you and to your people. But Naomi said, No, 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 return home, my daughters. Why would you come with me? Am I going to have any more sons that become your husbands? I mean, return home, daughters. I'm too old to have another husband, and even if I thought there was still hope for me, even if I had a husband tonight and gave birth to sons, would you wait until they grew up? Would you remain unmarried for them? No, my daughters, it's more bitter for me than for you because the Lord's hand has turned against me. At this, they wept aloud again, and then Ophrah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye, but Ruth clung to her. Look, said Naomi, your sister-in-law is going back to her people and her gods. Go back with her. But Ruth replied, don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. 
Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if death separates you and me. I don't know if you can make this much more clear if you're Ruth. (laughs) And when Naomi realized that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped urging her. And so Naomi is ready to go back to Bethlehem to see if there's anything left there for her. And she realizes this is not the best interest of uh, Naomi realizes it's not in the best interest of Ruth and Ophrah to go back with me. Like, they still have a life. They have family in Moab. They, have, they can go back to their mother. They, 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 they still have hope. They can get married. They can try to have another family. Like, but for me, you know, it, it's, it's kind of over. And so she, she selfish, selflessly says, just, just go back. Just stay with your family. And then she begins to bless them. I love this. She says, may the Lord show you kindness as you've shown kindness to me. May the Lord just bless you. And she blesses them. And it's often, I think, one of the things we can learn here is it's often those seasons of transition, those seasons where we're saying goodbye to someone or we're leaving, you're leaving a workplace, you're leaving and going to a new city, you're, you're leaving maybe even a, a church or whatever it is. In those moments of transition, often we go out firing shots instead of going out by blessing those that we're leaving. Often we, we try to make ourselves feel better about the leaving part. And just say, uh, you know, for, for Naomi here, she could have been, you know what? There's something wrong with you, Ruth and Oprah, that my son's died. Like, there must have been something wrong with you. And, and, and not only that, you, neither of you could produce kids. You were both barren, no, no grandkids. Like, Naomi could have gone out parting shots to make herself feel better about the situation. But instead, she goes out blessing these young women. In the midst of this, Oprah takes her up on the offer and says, okay, I'll go, I'll go back. But Naomi... But, but Ruth here says, no, 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 I'm, I'm with you in this. I'm with you in this. And this is so beautiful because Naomi is in the midst of such deep loss. She's ready to throw in the towel. And what Naomi needs more than anything is someone just to be with her. Someone to be a faithful presence in her life. And this is really kind of the, the big idea I want to hammer home here. It's on the, the next slide is that when you are overwhelmed with loss, you need someone to be a faithful presence. Like you just need someone to stick by you. When you're overwhelmed and you're just going through a difficult time, you just need someone to be there. But often what, what can happen is that when we, when we see someone going through a difficult time, maybe they've, they've lost a loved one or maybe they've found out they're diagnosed with cancer or maybe they, they, they've lost a job or they're struggling with their mental health, often we withdraw from that person because we don't know what to do. We don't know how to help them. We're afraid we're going to stick our foot in the mouth, our mouth and say the wrong thing. Has anyone ever been there? You're like, I just, I don't know what to do. I don't know how to help them. And so we withdraw. But, but really what we need to do is to step in and engage because in the midst of that, they just need someone to be a faithful presence in their life, to be with them in it. The other thing that can happen is that when someone's going through just loss and struggle is instead of just being that faithful presence is we can be the presence of, uh, of someone who's just trying to fix it and make everything okay and, and give like the positive platitude of like, you know what, it's going to be fine, it's going to be fine. It's, you know, God has a plan, it's all going to work out, it's just part of God's design and, and you just got to have faith and just hold on and things are going to be good. But if you just lost a loved one or you just found out you have cancer, that's not the message you need to hear in that moment. See, Naomi believes that, that even God has turned against her. She doesn't even think God is a faithful presence with her anymore, and so she needs someone to be that for her. She needs someone to be for her in her life what God is, but she can't see it in the moment. And this is what Ruth steps in to be, and, and here it says that, that, that as Oprah leaves, Ruth clung to Naomi. And that word for cl- clung there is the same word in the Hebrew scriptures when it says a man should leave his father and mother and cling to his wife. It's the same word. So like the same amount of loyalty and faithfulness and commitment that a husband would show to his wife, Ruth is giving that kind of commitment and faithfulness to Naomi. That's amazing. And this is what we need when we're going through a difficult time. A few months ago, I was going through just kind of a difficult season. It was one where I, uh, in many ways, just wanted to throw in the towel. And I reached out to just uh, several of my friends who have been there faithful through my life and just shared, this is going on. Would you just be praying for me? And 
it just gave me a tremendous amount of strength as they were just faithful friends with me and prayed with me and checked in on me. And I knew I wasn't alone through this, that I had God with me and I had my friends with me as well. I had someone that was a faithful presence. And God always wants to be that faithful presence in our lives, and he is, but sometimes we're so blinded by the bitterness, we're so blinded by our reality that we can't see it, and so we need to actually see it through another human being. This is what Ruth is for Naomi. The story continues here in verse 19. Let's pick it up. It says this, So the two women went on until they came to Bethlehem, remember the house of bread, and they arrived in Bethlehem, and the whole town was stirred because of them. And the woman exclaimed, can this be Naomi? This is Naomi? It's been a while. Don't call me Naomi, she told them. Call me Mara, because the Almighty has made my life very bitter. I went away full, but the Lord brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi? <laughs> Do you hear the pain in her voice? The Lord has afflicted me. The Almighty has brought misfortune upon me. So Naomi returned from Moab, accompanied by Ruth, the Moabite, her daughter-in-law, arriving in Bethlehem as the barley harvest was beginning. Some important things here, too, I really want to unpack. One is this word Mara that she tells people to call her, and then the other is this idea of a barley harvest happening in the house of bread. So, Naomi had a perspective that God was against her. She's bitter. She's angry. Not just at life, but with God. She thinks God's against her. Now, as I've been studying Ruth, I've heard a lot of commentaries on it and, and different people's perspectives on Ruth. And as you get to this section in Ruth chapter 1, a lot of the biblical commentators um, like to beat up on, Ruth, on, on Naomi. They like to say, well, Naomi should have just had some more faith. Naomi should realize God's with her. I mean, we know the end of the story because we can read all four chapters at once, but Naomi's had a pretty rough decade. She lost her husband. She lost another son. Then she lost another son. Like, she's lost everything. She's had a rough time. And, and some of the, the commentators are like, ah, oh, she just needs to have more faith and not be bitter. And why would she think God's with her, against her? God's with her. And, and, and when I read it, I realize, no, no, no. <laughs> Naomi's had a rough time. Naomi, in a way, it's not unnatural for her to feel this way. And in their ancient worldview, two, three thousand years ago, the way people viewed the world was like if your life was going poorly and if you couldn't have kids or, or if, if, if everyone kept dying around you or you, you just weren't successful in any way, that meant that you had done something to anger the gods or God, that you had upset them. And that God's hand was against you. That was just their worldview then. Now we have a different worldview. We, we understand that there's more realities. We live in a world where there's sin and fallenness and brokenness all around us. And that impacts us. And other people impact us and their decisions. And there's a whole spiritual realm of evil impacting us as well. And so we know it's just not uh, God trying to cause us uh, to suffer in our lives. But this is the worldview that Naomi has. And so as she goes back into Bethlehem, you can imagine like her old friends come and be like, Naomi's back. Yeah, let's have a party. Naomi's back. The pleasant one. Remember, her name meant the pleasant one. But she says, no, call me Mara because God has made my life very bitter. And this is interesting because if you're a Jewish person reading this back in the day and you knew the scriptures, you knew the Torah, and you knew the story of Israel, when you hear the word Mara, some things are going to be triggered for you. Some images are going to come to mind in the, from the book of Exodus. See, in, in, in the Exodus, uh, there's a story where it's recorded in Exodus 15, but the, the people of God have been in slavery for 400 years in Egypt. You remember, Moses leads them out of slavery in Egypt, and uh, Pharaoh says, finally, you, you guys can go, go out in the desert and worship. And and then Pharaoh has second thoughts about that and says his armies to pursue Moses. And remember the Red Seas parted and Moses and the Israelites cross on dry land through the Red Sea. And then as the armies of Pharaoh come across on that dry land, the waters implode on them. And the people of Israel are safe and they get across and they think life's going to be good. But then they go three days wandering around in the desert without water. Three days, no water. 
And they probably brought a little bit with them from Egypt, but they're running out by then because how much water can you carry? <laughs> and uh, has anyone here gone three days without water? I don't think any of us probably ever had that experience. Um, I've gone three days without food, but never without water. And so they get to a place where there's a body of water, and they think, yes, we have water. And I can imagine, like, three days of not drinking, if you saw some water, you'd be pretty excited, and they, they, they you know, they don't think like, hey, did anyone bring a filtration system with them? They're just like, let's go drink. So they get down, and they're lapping up the water, and the story says the water was Mara. The water was there. See, it looked like everything was going well. It was like for, for Naomi, when, when she has her husband, she has her sons, and they go to Moab, and there's food there. It seems like everything's going well. They've, they have some freedom, like things are going to be all right, but then they lose everything and experience Mara. It's what the Israelites experience in the desert. And so they begin complaining to Moses even more. You know, the water is Mara, Moses. You just let us out here to die. And God tells Moses to pick up a piece of wood and to throw it in the water. And so Moses does. He throws it in the water, and what happens? The water becomes sweet. The, the bitter water becomes drinkable, and they're able to drink from the waters of Mara because they're no longer Mara. They're no longer bitter. And then they continue, and they come to an oasis in Elam where there's palm trees and springs. And so there's this foreshadowing going on here in chapter 1 of Ruth that Mara might not be so bad, that God can work with Mara, that God before in the story of Israel has transformed the bitter times into sweet times that God has provided, and perhaps God will do this for Naomi and Ruth. And then we get down to the end, there's this verse that's just summing up what's happened in chapter 1, and it says, as they return to Bethlehem, it's the beginning of the barley harvest. It's interesting because remember when Naomi leaves Bethlehem, it's because there's famine. The house of bread is empty. The cupboards are bare. There was famine as far as food went. But now she returns and there is, it's harvest time. There's food in the house of bread again, but Naomi has a famine in her soul. The cupboards of her soul are empty. And will they be replenished in the house of bread? Will Bethlehem have anything to offer her, and there's some hope here at the end of chapter 1 that she's returning, and the barley harvest is happening. Things may just be okay eventually. They may just work out. So throughout chapter 1, there's this idea that, for Naomi at least, God isn't with her, and we've Maybe you've been through moments, and maybe you're in one right now where you feel like God has abandoned me. I can't hear God's voice. He seems far away. He seems distant. And if we're honest, we all, we all have been through those types of seasons. And I want to encourage us with the words from Psalm 139. David, who we will find out his story is tied to Ruth's story, Naomi's story, says this, Psalm 139, verse 7, Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you're there. If I make my bed in the depths, you're there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. I think God's with, there, with Naomi. He's there. She just can't see him in the moment. And so who does she have to be there with her? She has Ruth. Ruth is willing to give it all up to be there with Naomi. And, and maybe you're lucky enough, you've had someone like a Ruth in your life that's willing to give it all up to be there with you in your painful moments. But if you haven't, I want you to know that you have a Savior, you have a Jesus who is willing to give it all up to be there with you throughout your life. He was willing to humble himself and, and, and set aside all of the privileges of, of, of heaven and of perfection and of holiness and uh, of being with the Father. And he humbled himself, becoming a servant, showing us what it means to truly live and communion with God and then dying on our behalf as a, a sacrifice for our sins that we could be reconciled to the Father and, and to each other and, and to ourselves and to all creation through his blood. And so, 
this morning, we remember as we come to communion that, that Jesus is like Ruth, but, but better. Because Ruth could be that faithful presence for one person, for one Naomi, but Jesus can be that faithful presence for all of us. And so as we take communion today, uh, each of you should have a little cup like this. Um, you can peel off the first little film to get to the what we'll generously call bread. <laughs> and as we take it this morning, we'll remember that this represents the body of Christ broken for us. Jesus is the bread of life, born in the house of bread, the bread of life, and with him there's no famine. And then we'll take the cup, which represents the blood of Christ poured out for us for the forgiveness of our sins. And so would you uh, bow your heads and pray with me as we prepare to take this communion together. Father, I thank you for this beautiful story of Ruth. Excited over the next few weeks to get to explore it together and, and see what you would have to teach us through it. And I thank you that you are able to make the bitter sweet. That you are the faithful presence with us. And Lord, as we come to the communion table, we take some time just to examine our own hearts and lives to repent of the ways that we have been unfaithful to you. And we take hope in the words of Scripture that when we are faithless, you remain faithful. When we're overcome with bitter and sorrow and anger and we're just jaded by life, that you are still faithful with us. And so, Lord, we come to take together this gift from your table. Would you nourish our souls through it? Amen. First Corinthians chapter 11, the apostle Paul gives instructions for the Lord's table, and he says, for what I received from the Lord, I passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. His body broken for us. Let's take it together. Jesus, every time we take communion, we pause to remember that you were broken so that we might be made whole. You were broken so that our world might be made whole. There might be hope for a future of wholeness. We look forward to the wholeness that you bring, not only in our lives, but ultimately one day in our world through the power of your resurrection. Amen. Paul continues in 1 Corinthians in verse 25. He says, in the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me, for whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's drink it together. Lord Jesus, we thank you that we are under a new covenant. A new covenant based upon what you've done for us, not what we can do for you. A new covenant that is not because we belong to a certain family or a certain lineage or a certain country or a certain nation or speak a certain language, but it's a covenant that's for people of every tribe, tongue, language, and nation. Through your work, Jesus. And so we celebrate communion and we worship together, realizing that we are one little chunk of your body here. One little piece in southeastern Utah of your big C church around the world. In every nation de declaring and praising you on this Sabbath day, on this Sunday. Declaring that you are faithful and telling stories of your faithfulness. I thank you that you were faithful to Naomi 
even when she couldn't see it, to see further in the story. And you're faithful to us even when we can't see it in our present circumstance. Lord, we worship you and we love you. Amen. Bless church. We're going to introduce a new song. If you've listened to Caleb much, you may have heard it. It talks about Jesus being there in the midst of everything. Forgiveness at a price I couldn't pay. I'm not perfect, so I thank God every day that there was Jesus. Because in the waiting, in the searching, in the healing and the hurting, like a blessing buried in the broken pieces. Church, would you receive this benediction as we leave today? May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace in the midst of every moment of life. Amen. Go and have a great Sunday.